Hello, and welcome to Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. And each week, we invite you to send in your questions, and we'll explore the stories and the history of the city of Mississauga together. For this week's episode, we'll be focusing on Orange Shirt Day and Truth and Reconciliation, and how it connects in the city of Mississauga. We invite you to subscribe to our channel so you can stay up to date on future episodes of Ask a Historian. So joining us this week once again uh, is uh, John Dunlop, the manager of heritage planning and indigenous, re indigenous relations for the city of Mississauga. And uh, here we are talking on Orange Shirt Day, uh, a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, and we, the city of Mississauga uh, aligning itself with the, the Truth and Reconciliation Day has passed some resolutions uh, for things that it can do and how it can engage its residents, uh, particularly on uh, September 30th, but of course not only on that day. And uh, John, thank you for joining us. I was wondering if you could walk us through some of the things that the city has, uh, has made resolutions about and what plans are in place for uh, the day itself. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me, Matthew. So as you said, uh, City Council has passed a resolution to formally recognize September 30th as a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, that's in line with the federal legislation that was passed on this as a response to, uh, to the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which called for a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. It also coincides on September 30th, which is Orange Shirt Day. Um, so the city is recognizing um, both aspects of the day um, together. And so um, we are putting together a, a programming slate that's gonna be at Celebration Square. Um, it's gonna involve uh, the use of, uh, first of all, the Moccasin Identifier, which is an amazing project um, by the Mississaugas of the Credit. And the idea behind the Moccasin Identifier is that it's the stenciling of moccasins um, across places of significance. And uh, so we're going to be putting the moccasin stencils down uh, on the steps of City Hall. And they should, they should actually be there already in preparation for the day. Um, and the... Uh, the, the point is, is that it's a returning of the footprints of Indigenous people to places um, where there was erasure um, through colonization, through settlement, and through development. So that's, first and foremost, um, that's going to be, you know, the main feature. The, the Celebration Square is going to be given over to uh, programming to raise awareness about residential schools, about truth and reconciliation, and specifically about those 94 calls that, uh, to action that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And so there's going to be uh, a series of short films by Indigenous makers um, that talk about reconciliation, that talk about um, you know, a wide variety of what is important to Indigenous people, what is their Indigenous perspective. The goal for the city is really to, to raise awareness about Indigenous and Indigenous issues and so forth and give the space over um, to Indigenous creators for the day. So we'll also be playing music uh, from uh, Indigenous music from uh, CBC's archived playlists and so forth. And the, 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 the short films on the screen are going to be interspersed, as I said, with information about what is truth and reconciliation and what are the 94 calls and, and how, how can the residents respond. And so that's, that's first and foremost what's going to be on offer. We're also going to be promoting it on social media as well. Um, you know, this, th this is a new holiday. It was just created in June, which um, so there was, uh, you know, it was a short runway to get everything up and running and uh, we'll be looking to expand it next year. We're also still dealing with uh, COVID restrictions. So it couldn't be a large scale event like everybody wants it to be um, or hopes it to be, uh, but we are focusing on uh, getting the message out as well. So there's going to be extensive information on social media, just like Heritage Mississauga has already begun, uh, you know, your social media campaign raising awareness on reconciliation and the calls to action leading up to the day. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity for residents to 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 gain awareness, to 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 educate themselves further um, and to uh, find answers to what I'm sure are a lot of questions around what is truth and reconciliation? Um, why is it important and what is the history, not just here in Mississauga, but but nationally? What is the history of residential schools and their impact? I, I, and and uh, these are 
so important things, and, and this might sound like it's belittling it, and I don't mean that, but it, it, it's timely now because this is part of the national consciousness, but it's long overdue at the same time, and, and, and it, it's a conversation we should be engaged in and, and, and learn more about. Um, even even for you know myself, and I, I don't want to speak for you necessarily, but the, the the learning process continues for us who even work in this field, let alone those who are outside of it and, and perhaps touching this for the first time or learning about it for the first time in this past year. You know, from Cam Loops and and uh, uh, you know moving forward with the other stories that we have seen, uh, it's not new for many of us, but but it, it is new in the national uh, conversation, I suppose. Uh, Absolutely. And that's and, and, and what you said is true. I've been working, I've had the honor of working with Indigenous communities for almost 25 years, but I continually learn more every day. Um, I mean, it's, they have a distinct, they are a culture and a society and a group of people unto themselves. They are not, um, they, they should not have a minimized story and their history is rich and extensive, as extensive as any other history that of from the settlers that come and make up Canada. And so that all that means is that there's always a chance to learn, learning the languages, you know, speaking Ojibwe, speaking Mohawk, um, speaking these languages again, um, and, 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 you know, with the goal of hopefully making them recognize languages in Canada, just like English and French, um, but looking to understanding more and understanding how we and our and our ancestors contributed to a system that caused so much harm to a people and benefited um, settlers to such a degree that it's going to take generations to really overcome this. But that doesn't mean that, you know, this isn't something that we then wait for the next generation to start solving. We need to start working towards it now. I, I, I couldn't say it any better. The uh, the, the terms truth and reconciliation, uh, what, I've, what I've talked to, to some people about is reconciliation is the process, but truth is where we're at right now in that process. Um, and, and, you know, the reconciliation is the path that we, we want to, to get towards or get to or work towards, but, but we're still in, in the, 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 the gathering stage of information to develop those truths. And, and uh, we're in its infancy. Uh, as much as it's in the public consciousness now, uh, in terms of conversation, uh, you know, we're still very early on in, in in the overall process of this of the conversation. That's that's entirely true. And and Jesse Wente, who's the chair of the Canadian Council for the Arts, um, and is himself Indigenous from Serpent River, um, he you know he's stated that that's exactly the point. Six years on from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which released its final reports in 2015, we're still very much at that phase of truth telling. You know, there's still, um, I think the discovery from uh, Kamloops, from all the other schools, um, as well as incorporating, you know, it's important to remember that the truth and reconciliation reports held hundreds and hundreds of identified deaths that occurred at these schools. Um, and there's been thousands and thousands of, of now identified children that died at these schools, but that's still very much new information for a lot of Canadians. And so understanding the context behind them, understanding that it isn't just, you know, residential schools. And this is, this is the challenge with that the truth and reconciliation found was, it isn't just residential schools. Residential schools were part of um, indigenous rights on reserves, on treaties, on you know what came after residential schools with the 60s scoop, on the continual systematic racism that they continue to fight every day and that all systems um, have built into them. And that's, you know, so it's, you can't tackle one issue and say, well, we solved it. You know, it's it's something that's always growing. The calls to action that uh, that the city, you know, that affect municipalities like the city, there's actually only a handful of them out of the 94. A lot of the 94 are focused at the federal government level because they hold the main relationship, that nation to nation relationship with First Nations. Yeah. But the ones that apply to the local municipality, um, you know, we continue to take action on them. We don't declare, you know, one of them says that we will uh, renew treaty relationships. Well, a renewed relationship isn't something that you hammer out over a barbecue or, you know, say, hey, we did some nice things for each other. We have a renewed relationship, you know, we're done. It's going to be continual work. 
It's not something that we can say, we took action on this one time and we're done. I, I do want to come back to what the city has, has, has uh, uh, stated that they will do around the points of action that they can respond to. Um, but, but one of the thing that's listed on the website, and we will share the link to the Truth and Reconciliation web, website that the city of Mississauga has put together for its resources. Um, but it's also listed uh, tours at the Bradley Museum around Truth and Reconciliation. And uh, I, I know that doesn't directly involve you, but wondering if you can highlight a little bit perhaps of what they will be working on uh, as, as uh, promoted on the, on the website. Yeah, absolutely. So they're going to be working on, again, promoting, um, you know, giving, giving their space over to telling Indigenous stories for the day uh, leading up to um, September 30th. Their focus is going to be on the, that education component of, uh, you know, what, what happened at residential schools and, um, you know, telling the stories is because again the bradley museum is was you know it's when you get to it it, it looks like a uh, homestead from the 19th century so it's got that air of of settler history so it's really about making sure that we're not telling settler stories we have lots of other time in the year to tell settler stories this is about telling those indigenous stories and the museum does an amazing amount of work with the indigenous communities uh their blooms and berries festival um the maple magic maple madness uh maple the, magic <laughs> maple magic sorry uh the maple magic festival and so forth um they've been incorporating indigenous stories into their teachings for a long time so it's going to be a lot of, of of sharing those stories and, and and it's another opportunity to be uh you know educating and, and raising the awareness and and understanding that um you know the museum people go to a museum because they expect to be looking at something from the past but the museum is working to ensure that there's uh contemporary stories being told as well okay. because you know i think it's important to note there's always been indigenous people in mississauga they've never left yeah. um you know and as much as they you know they may have been ignored they've always been here and and that's an important you know we have to remember that we're on their land and they've never left it the, uh, I, I remember talking to uh, uh, Carolyn King uh, uh, several years ago when Moccasin Identifier was first getting off the ground, and uh, they used the, the terminology of "we were here and we are still here," <laughs> and and that that being the identifier, it, both connecting to past and present, but also highlighting a road to the future. And I think it's it's such a subtle message but a powerful one. And, and so the, my, I encourage anyone to check out Mox and Identifier, uh, not only at that Celebration Square on the day, but go to the website. We'll, again, we'll share the link, uh, learn about its programs, become involved. They, these are things you can do yourselves uh, and uh, uh, really uh, send a powerful, simple message and uh, an amazing program to be honest, a really amazing program. It really is. And that's, I mean, that's the, that's the thing is that I think um, for most of us coming through the modern education system here in Canada, um, you know, we were taught that you were very much taught that the indigenous was something that happened in the past, you know, indigenous peoples were here was the strongest lesson that I received going through school um, and that they went somewhere else. They went away um, and they're not here anymore. And that's the story that gets told even up to, um, you know, the CBC, um, mini series on Canada people's history where they gave one episode to the indigenous story, which spanned 10,000 years, and then another nine episodes for settler history. Um, and it's, you know, it, it again puts the focus, you know, on, on the settlers and, and not telling those stories properly and not making people aware that, um, you know, they, they've always been here. They are always going to be here. We've, we've thrown, everything we could at them to, to eradicate their, their culture. Um, and they've withstood it and they've, you know, they, they show a level of, um, determination and, and they, they, they do not, uh, they do not disappear and, and nor should they, um, you know, and so a lot of this is about realizing and understanding what was done in the name of Canada for a very long period of time. And, you know, how does, how do we, move beyond that you know? and, and we, we talk about it I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm connecting to the words you just said we've done this for a very long period of time but we're not dealing with ancient history I mean we're dealing with 
current news around safe drinking water and the structures of reserves and you know part of the english uh, leaders debate on the the this most recent federal election uh, revolved around what to do about the indian act there was a question on that i mean i mean we're dealing with current issues that are still affecting the lives of, of hundreds and thousands of people and has done so for generations upon generations like it, it just it it's uh, as you said it's entrenched um, and it, it's not just peeling back one thing and dealing with it. It, it, it. This will be a systematic generational change. This past this past federal election that we just had uh, very recently, this is the first federal election where Indigenous concerns and Indigenous issues was uh, generally found within the top 10 issues in almost all of the polling. So it's, it's the first time that it's really consistently uh, been raised to a national level, but that's there's a consistency across the nation of, of people who have educated themselves and become more aware even in the last six months and, and realized, hang on, you know, why do people live under boil water advisories for 25 years, uh, you know, and are, and are beginning to demand more um, from the federal government in terms of reconciliation. Um, and I think that's something that's only going to only going to continue, you know, and and um, it, 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 having a day, well, having, having two days because, and an entire month, uh, in June to reflect on indigenous history and so forth, but specifically having a federal holiday for this, um, is going to help remind everyone annually, you know, it's, it's very much operates the same way as Remembrance Day, you know, and, and it, uh, you know, that same mentality of lest we forget, you know, lest we forget that this was not a, a bad summer where there were some, you know, some bad news stories from residential schools, but we can, you know, it's moved, shifted out of the, the news stream and we can move on. It's, it's a constant work for everyone. I, and yeah, you know, after, never mind, lest we forget, I think as a nation, we forgot. Um, and, and we, you know, it's hard work and it's going to be ongoing almost in a sense too bad <laughs> we have to do it uh and you know we've lived with the blinders on for too long um and uh and we do have to to see those truths and and, and understand those truths and let a people let people who were directly affected by these institutions speak and share their truths um and, and you know give the space give the time give the voice um and and, and hear what it is what it, what's being said and, uh, and come to terms with it. We can't always just celebrate the high points in Canadian history, right? Like you, you have to, if you, if you embrace the stories of things that you champion and, and like and the nice stories, you, you also have to understand that not everything's been roses for everybody. And uh, um, so what this, you, you mentioned the city has addressed points uh, um, that affect municipalities, or the, uh, say affect municipalities, but municipalities can affect. Um, I was wondering if you can highlight some of the things that, uh, that Mississauga is uh, resolved uh, at addressing or doing uh, or as a city. Absolutely. So, um, you know, going back to earlier this year um, with the news that, that you know, of, of all the unmarked burials from all the residential schools. Uh, council made uh, a, a motion and uh, an understanding um, that, uh, you know, we had, to, we had to change Canada Day this year um, and come up with a, a better way of uh, um, marking a celebration of Canada as a nation against the history that we were currently facing. And council passed, uh, uh, a further resolution to just amending our Canada Day to um, including a call to the federal governments to to cease their uh, appeals of uh, the um, human rights decisions that had been uh, that factored under Jordan's principle and under the settlements that had been reached with residential school survivors um, and uh, and 60 scoop survivors. So um, you know, city council has shown. Um, a determination to 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 seek justice and stand in solidarity with Indigenous people. That's important. Um, you know, more to that, um, we've looked at the calls to action. Um, you know, and that's that's not one that specifically applied to um, Mississauga, but it's one that we took action on nevertheless. Another one, as I alluded to earlier, was a renewal of our relationship with treaty partners. So, um, for the Mississaugas of the credit, you know, council passed a resolution that they would. 
um, raise the flag of the Mississaugas of the credit and fly it alongside the regional, provincial, and federal flags um, in council chambers. That hasn't happened um, yet only because of COVID, because that's something that we need to um, gather and celebrate when that happens. And that's sadly something that we haven't been able to do. But at the same time, we amended the bylaw, which gives Mississauga its name and added for the first time into that bylaw recognition of its Ojibwe origins, of its uh, Anishinaabeum origins of saying, this is not our, this isn't a settler name. This isn't some, you know, even though the residents chose this name, um, it's not, it's not an English name, you know, it's, there is an origin there and it's something I've always reflected on and it speaks to what, um, you know, going back to the moccasin identifier, the name persisted in this area. Then, and, and, and to the point that the, that the residents recognized it when it was time to make it a city in the sixties, um, and say, this is the proper name for this place. That's not accidental. You know, that's not, oh, we just randomly picked this name because we liked it. Uh, that's because there is a persistence to the name. There is an identity to this land um, that is that is home to the Mississaugas and is ho now home to all Mississaugans as well. You know, it's it's a persistence of of that identity. Um, we have continually worked with um, to promote Indigenous athletes and work to promote um, Indigenous. Uh, youth athletes. Um, the city hosts the little NHL hockey uh, hockey tournament every year. Um, it's coming up on a 50th anniversary soon, so um, that's going to be something to see. Um, you know, and then um, when it comes to things like looking at business and so forth, we have a sustainable procurement policy which um, was revised recently to to be more inclusive to to um, address, um, you know, indigenous businesses and give them an opportunity to do business with the city. And we're further expanding that, um, you know, like we're, we're looking at these policies, we're continually looking at these policies and how can we make them even better? You know, so there's, there's always goals um, to, to grow and increase attracting indigenous business um, to Mississauga, um, making sure that the city is doing business with indigenous businesses where applicable. Um, and, um, you know, finally there's the, there's UNDRIP, which the federal government just passed. So we'll be, um, council will be looking at that this fall to say, does, is the city going to recognize UNDRIP? Um, you know, and, and, and UNDRIP being the United, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And when it was passed, I want to say about a dozen years ago, but my timing might be off. I don't know it off the top of my head. You know, Canada, the U.S., Brazil, Australia, and New Zealand were the only five countries that didn't sign to it because they all had significant Indigenous populations and they didn't want to recognize those rights. So, you know, again, a lot of work that should have, a lot of recognition and a lot of work that, to your point, never should have needed to have happened, um, but it did, and it's the systems that we operated in. So now it's about changing those systems, you know, and, and how do we do that? Um, and, and how are we going to be making space here in Mississauga? Not, I shouldn't say making space, that's the wrong term. How are we going to increase ind indigeneity here in Mississauga? You know, um, because it's not, it's not our space to give back. It's always been their space, you know, um, and how, and making sure that we give them access and that we don't put up barriers. Right. And that, that's, you know, we talked about systematic change, but in some cases, the barriers are so entrenched into our method of thinking that, you know, that even the change of something simple in the way that we recognize property and the way that we, uh, you know, conduct our, our, our regular business and choices of purchase and uh, procurement and all those, sort of, like it, the systematic change is invasive through every level and, and, and changing that is such a, uh, I, I mean, it, it has to be done and it should be done, but it, it, it will be a long process in, in changing that. Um, but maybe that plays into the fact where you, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, Indigenous people have always been here and will always be here. Uh, and, and perhaps that idea of time is on their side and it's now on us to move the ball or to move the court. Um, well, and that's, reconciliation has to be uncomfortable and it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, there's no... There's no two ways around it. If we're if we're going to do this um, as a society, as a nation, um, then it's gonna it's gonna be an uncomfortable thing because we're going to come to face facts about our country and about our history that we don't want to hear. Um, I mean, it, in in some ways, I, I I see it as almost 
you know, imagine you're a present day German person that had to suddenly learn about, um, you know, World War II and everything around concentration camps and so forth and suddenly coming to grips with, you know, because that's, that's the reality. That's what we had. Um, and that's really hard. And, um, and then it's about making systemic change and, and making, making sure there's, there's the opportunities that are afforded to everybody and making sure that, that those opportunities are afforded to everybody. So, so how would you, on, on, on a day like November 3rd, or November 3rd, on a day like September 30th, or any other day, whether it be uh, Indigenous Persons Day or any other day, time of the year, in fact, I don't, I don't think we should be relegating ourselves to a single day here or anything like that, but it, a resident of this city today, finding out about, you know, wanting to learn more, wanting to uh, develop an understanding, go to resources, what would you suggest somebody to, to be able to connect with? Uh, I, I mean, your website, again, we'll, we will share that. But uh, I mean, there are so many things there. But somebody starting out, uh, looking for information, looking on how they can uh, connect to those 94 calls to action. Um, any suggestions, any direction? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think at first it's important um, for residents to um, to understand the history that took place here in Mississauga. We have, um, there is an extensive history. And as you and I have already discussed, you know, the Credit Indian Mission is a place where um, there was a lot of, it, it was not insignificant in the decisions that regarded nation building and the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the rest of Canada. I think there's substantial evidence that would suggest that you know, there were a lot of government officials that visited that that mission when it was running because it was, you know, just down the highway from York, so it was easily reachable. Um, and the fact that um, it was uh, the opportunity to move was raised uh, with to the Mississaugas, um, you know, very early on in their, you know, once they they'd really just gotten settled for one generation, and then it was it was time, for, you know, the the government decided it was time for them to move on and. Um, they were able to retain a lot of agency in that decision, but, um, you know, it's, it's understanding that history. So there's the, um, there's the healing and friendship garden down on Mississauga road. Um, I know it's not the most convenient place to get to, but, um, if you, if it's good weather, um, you know, I would always recommend, you know, Heritage Mississauga has put up some amazing plaques there that give a history of, of that property. Um, and that space definitely, heard, again, Heritage Mississauga's website, as we spoke to earlier, the museums will be running tours. So there's lots of, there's lots of places you can go. Um, definitely, if you have the opportunity, come by Celebration Square, take in some of that programming that's going to be there. We'll have information about the moccasin identifier, um, you know, and, but I would also encourage, and, and we'll have the links on our websites, visit the First Nations and Indigenous communities websites. Read their stories in their own words. Um, you know, the Mississaugas of the Credit have a great website with historical tidbits and blogs and, and, and offer up so much information about themselves and, and where they come from. It's the same with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the, the Huron-Wendat Nation. The information is there. And I think most importantly, it's in their words. It's their history that they're telling and, and read it and understand it and, and start to take in that Indigenous perspective. And, you know, if you're home, you know, that evening, you know, um, instead of going to your regular Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever, you know, CBC Gem has a lot of Indigenous content. Take in an Indigenous show. There's a lot of them. Uh, you know, just YouTube, um, the NFB has a, an amazing catalog of Indigenous short film. Um, there's so much media out there that's being created. Take it in, take in a show. They, they make, like, they, they, they make incredible shows and it, and it's telling the story of Canada through a completely different perspective that you probably haven't encountered before. And that's, you know, that's how you gain awareness. That's how you take that in. Um, and, and then look for opportunities again, events haven't really been on offer for the last two years now. So it, it's challenging. But again, you know, hopefully looking into 2022, we'll be able to start offering more and more events. And, um, you know, Heritage Mississauga runs a ton of events and so forth. And, you know, come out and and participate in these events. Um, I've 
everyone is always welcome. The goal of doing them is, is always been to um, have the community come out and join with the indigenous community to understand what they're doing and, and why they're doing it. So, um, you know, but on, on September 30th, you know, it's really about um, take the time to, to raise some awareness. Um, if you're, if you have kids and they're in school, I'm sure the curricula is going to be touching on orange shirt day and residential schools. Talk to your kids about it because they need to understand it. And it's, it's a lot. It's a very heavy topic. And, you know, I know, I know the education system is doing a great job to, to explain it in a way that's accessible to kids. But I know with my own children, they walk away with more questions than answers always because yeah. they just, it's, it's so far from their own personal experience. They don't understand, you know, the simplicity, the humanity of the situation. Why would somebody do that to somebody else? Yeah. And then it's on us as that, uh, you know, the teaching generation, if you will, to explain that, you know, this happened for generations and it was something perhaps that we were not uh, involved in, that our education is evolving just as theirs is evolving as, as young people today, uh, for, for the most part. And, and uh, you know, that th this is part of our national story. So that I think they will have a different perspective on growing up in Canada than we did, uh, let alone our parents did. And, and uh, uh it's probably about time that that, con that conversation shift uh, begins to happen. And uh, uh, hopefully the, the candidate that they inherit is, is uh, a little bit more of a wider perspective than the one that we did. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that will continue from there. So, uh, John, uh, um, I, I think maybe that's a high point of conversation to, to end on, on, on sharing the resources and, and connecting to September 30th and Orange Shirt Day, National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, and, uh, you know, here we are wearing orange. Hopefully we'll see a lot of orange out there in the community. Uh, just knowing that it's a statement for a day, but it's it's the beginning of a perspective change as well. And, and, and hopefully that resonates beyond just the single day. Um, and again, we'll share the links and the, and the, and the connections that we have and, and look forward to exploring um, our Indigenous connections, our Indigenous roots uh, and resources uh, in, in continued conversations. And uh, maybe we'll be back here a year from now and, uh, and reflect on, uh, on, on other programs that the city has developed and other connections that have been made and perhaps the, the, the strides that have been made in the, in the, in the years between. Um, and maybe even in-person events, we'll see. <laughs> I did want to say too to, to residents, if you're looking for something to do, again, if you're looking for an action to take on today, on September 30th, um, you know, fly an orange shirt out your window. Um, if you don't have an orange shirt, orange cloth, orange construction paper, um, you know, the, the color is the symbol of solidarity. And if you want to show your solidarity, flying something like that out your window is, is a very good way of demonstrating, you know, that you're, um, you know, that, that you're bearing some of the responsibility that you're seeking awareness on this. And, um, you know, working, working towards um, your own growing awareness. And, and I mean, it's, it's going to be a constant life journey because, um, you know, there's, there's always something more to learn and something more to take in and something more that you could do. But, you know, even just as a start, because this is the first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, show your support for it by, by wearing an orange shirt or, or hanging your orange shirt in the window. And, and, you know, that's a strong symbol to Indigenous people in your neighborhood that you are standing in solidarity with them. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, again, I look forward to seeing uh, lots of orange out there on, on, on uh, uh, today. So, so John, thank you for spending some time with us here at Ask a Historian and uh, look forward to a, a continued conversation with you always. It's been a pleasure, Matthew. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us here at Ask a Historian. And thank you for reflecting with us as we explore the topics of Orange Shirt Day and Truth and Reconciliation. And again, we invite you to send in your questions. You can email them, either just regular email or send an audio file to info at heritagemississauga.org and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date for future episodes. Again, thank you for joining us and we look forward to exploring more stories of the city of Mississauga with you in future episodes of Ask a Historian.